what's good in Age of Sigmar 3rd edition, and tips on making a decent list. A guide for new players and also current players who aren't fully up to speed on 3.0 yet. I'm Haywo, I stream on Twitch, let's plow ahead. If you're an open player, don't worry about anything the Games Workshop employee currently giving you an in-store demo will handle this for you. They will tell you that open play is one of the official three ways to play, but this is a meme. No one does this. However, you're in luck because the other two aren't. 2K matched is what everyone plays, and narrative is match play, but on New Game Plus. As always, try before you buy with friends and empty bases or on TTS to see if the playstyle of the faction you think looks the sweetest is actually fun for you to play. I made a video in 2nd edition about this called Every Army in 16 Minutes. It's still mostly relevant, and I'll have an updated version for 3rd edition as soon as some more new battle tomes come out. First you need the core rules, which are free to download from the GW site. Then get the General's Handbook 2021, which is essentially filled with matched rules plus the battle plans you'll play with. Find your FAQs to make sure stuff works how you think it works, and figure out what changed because they band-aided a bunch of stuff for the transition to third. Open up War Scroll Builder, it's on the community site, it is the best army builder. But having said that, it's a bunch of drop-down boxes on a website. Just because it lets you do something doesn't mean it's legal, check your rules, know your FAQs. So okay, you got a faction, you got the rules, staring at an empty list builder. From there, some standard stuff is pick a sub-faction from your battle tome. These give you bonus powers at the cost of eating your command trait and forcing you to generally take a bad artifact. <laughs> However, the good one or two sub-factions per army are almost ubiquitously better than using a default trait and artifact, though there are arguably like three exceptions across all armies. Sometimes, if you're doing something very specific. They often point you in a direction like Thunder Lizard buffs Bastilladons and Castellai Dynasty buffs Blood Knights, etc., so consider playing those in them. My rule of thumb is, start with a unit that is good and choose synergies and rules that make it great. Starting with something bad and spending choices and points on stuff to make it okay is throwing good money after bad. Question, are the sub-factions within an army internally balanced so that you as a new player are reasonably protected from making a costly mistake? The answer is no. More than half of the sub-factions in each army are trash. Often there's only one or two out of six which are good, which is a drag. That being said, hey, I guess it keeps me employed since I make AOS advice, YouTube, and Twitch content for a living. Twitch Prime. What makes a unit good? A question so simple it can only have a complicated answer. For me, I pull in some movie review experience, which often starts by asking the question, what was it trying to do and did it succeed? In other words, what is a unit trying to do, how well can it succeed at that, and how consistently can it do so, for what cost? So step two, what are the different things a unit may be trying to do? In other words, what are the roles or jobs units can have in AOS? These are my opinions, so grain of salt, I go to tournaments, but I'm not gunning for 5-0 first places or anything. I'm locked in on my pet faction and try to optimize after that, not before. This is common. Sometimes you can find an alternative role for a unit by changing your plan for using it, and I'll mention those as well. So very broadly speaking, to me there are like four types of units. Units that give synergy, units that receive synergy, units that strongly do both, and units that are independently amazing. As for roles or jobs for units, if you play the game and have a bunch of 3rd edition ones under your belt, you can probably skip this section, but don't. I quit my job and I need that hot, sick ad revenue, and also I wrote a 5,000 word script for this video. Anvil, a unit that is very hard to kill, I consider a true anvil to be a unit that is defensive enough to survive being attacked by a medium spicy hammer for at least a double turn worth of attacks. If you can't do this, then hopefully you're supposed to also do some other job with it, just with higher than normal defense as a perk. Level 1 is great defense but weak to something, usually mortal wounds, or it's flawed in some other way. Example, Kragnos, Annihilators, Ish Lane Guard. Level 2 is having basically no Achilles heal, or at least a very specific one. They can survive full-on Death Stars. Example, Marathi, Phoenix Guard, Guo. Level 3 is not only can they weather most storms, but they thrive there in a way that makes it seem like the opponent is making no progress, or negative progress. Through some combination of killing their attackers, healing, and or extreme replenishing. Example, Gotrick, Archaon, on pink horrors. These levels aren't which ones are better, you decide that based on what else they can do and their points cost. It's always a balance. There are some problems with anvils that their subcategories try to solve in various ways. Sometimes your anvil is durable enough and you spend so many points on it that it behooves your opponent to simply ignore it, which can be a phantom waste of points. Like okay, you have 18 tyrant bashed gluttons with all out defense plus ash cloud fire belly, and that's indeed 72 battle shock immune wounds at negative 1 to hit on a 4 up save. But it's also 1065 points that are earning you only one victory point per turn, and now the rest of the table is 2k of opponent army versus 1k of yours. Furthermore, the Guru seasonal rules often allow a player to remove an objective on turn 3, and the one under all that stuff is probably the pick. Anvil subtype 1. 
They can't ignore you if you're in their face. Once you have one objective, zoom over to the next one and reinforce the original, or for when they remove the objective, to go to a new one. If you on average can't get there entirely during one turn, this is a problem, and the unit probably fails the test. This is solved by your anvils not being incredibly slow, especially having flying and or being able to teleport. This is called, in typical wargamer perspicacity, a fast anvil. Sometimes your anvil is reasonable at not dying, but that's it, and eventually they die having done really nothing else. Usually this is fine, and it's also basically the average anvil. Good defense, but slow, no offense, no utility. The new coherency rules exacerbate this with fewer models than ever, getting swings in for most combats, coupled with generally bigger bases for anvils, meaning even yet less offense. Also, many battle tactics require you to actually kill stuff, and battle tactics are just about equally important to objectives now, which is a big change from second. Anvil Subtype 2, a brick house that can still slap. They usually have a little less defense than your average anvil, but make up for it by killing their attackers. The tank takes less damage in the fight if it's a minute shorter, after all. These are called grinders, and it's something the Games Workshop has been mostly failing to properly write rules for for five years, despite clearly designing lots of units that are supposed to be grinders. For example, it's what they think Stormcast Paladins have always been. <coughs> Examples are hard to find just on War Scroll, mostly due to what I just said, so usually it's a build choice where you take something almost there and then buff it up with synergies. Example, old Hearthguard Berserkers and old Putrid Blight Kings, but they're both worse now. We'll see how the third edition meta shakes out. Another Another subcategory of anvil that tries to solve problem number two in a different way is a tar pit, or maybe it's just more like a bonus. Some units have rules that force the opponent to stay fighting them forever, like no retreat rules or hordes with extra pile-in distance, to surround enemies like a white blood cell. These are more rare in 3rd edition, for all the reasons previously mentioned. A proper anvil of some type is a good choice for your army if you have the tools to make them excel and an overall army strategy that wants to get ahead early and hold that bag. A caution is too many anvils can lead to a pillow-fisted army that suffers on battle tactics, and can't kill key targets when killing them is the best option. Or against infinite parachutes armies that simply teleport away and slurp up bonuses while you slowly crawl towards them, only to zoom away yet again. Hammer, a melee unit that smashes, but it can't smash if it can't get to the thing what needs smashing. For me, this isn't even a subtype thing. If you have no delivery method for your hammer, like high movement and flying, or at least deep strike ambush or teleports, then it's likely going to spend most of the game slowly dying to random stuff away from objectives. Pay close attention to the base size and weapon reach of the unit, because that, coupled with the new coherency rules that require you to stay 2 inch deep, even during pile-in, can entirely make or break a potential hammer. I'm talking literally double or triple the damage difference. If you have 32 mil or larger bases and 1 inch reach, there's like a 90% chance the unit is trash at dealing damage. Damage. When fighting hero monsters, it's very important to kill them in a single turn, else they can often heal back up from a variety of sources. My rule of thumb is 20 damage against a 4-up save is a good hammer. High rend is one way of making your damage more consistent on higher armor targets. And so rend 2 and 3 hammers are called can openers. Units that rely on rend got considerably worse in 3rd edition since high value key targets, especially hero monsters, even in an army with no other defensive buffs, have mystic shield, finest hour, and all out defense, to boost up to ignoring virtually any rend number you can get to, often still ending up on a 2 up save. Interestingly, sometimes the only difference between no rend and rend 2 is forcing your opponent to spend a command point. A buzzsaw or buckets of dice is a unit with lots of attacks, sometimes upwards of 60. Throw enough dice at them and they'll roll ones to save eventually, right? This strategy got weaker in third due to horde units having worse coverage from stricter coherency. Heavy hitters are units with multi-damage weapons. These are great because the force multiplication you get from buffs is extra effective. For troops, two damage is good, three damage is very good. For heroes, three is good, four and five up are very good. Random damage, like d3 from claws or especially d6 from one or two bite attacks, is not at all impressive because consistency is king. Of course, it can be great, just roll sixes lol. With so many armor bonuses in third edition, mortal wounds are the best way of making sure you actually kill something, either from proccing them on sixes to hit, or just doing a bunch from abilities, impact hits, or spells. Unlike with hits, sixes to wound procs are trash because you need to jump through an extra hoop of passing hit rolls first, generally reducing the frequency by half. There's no common term for well-costed units that do tons of mortal wounds, but most people call them OP. An assassin or a scalpel is a unit that can very consistently fly or otherwise ignore chaff to get right up to a hero target and kill it. 12 average damage to a 2-up save is my rule of thumb bare minimum. Targets often have a 5-up ward, so keep that in mind. 
These units are very rare. Sometimes your hammer has no good way of getting to a target, but it's so ludicrously damaging and immortal that the only thing the opponent can do is waste its time by feeding its sacrifices. This is called a Gotrick, and it's what a whole bunch of other slow, non-flying monsters try to be but fail. A glass cannon is all gas, no breaks. These are good because your point's budget wasn't wasted on stuff that isn't damage and movement, meaning they're often very well costed if risky unless you're Slanesh. Then you're a glass non-cannon that's 30% more expensive while also being straight up worse. Fast flying Flying hero monsters with 3 up base armor and high damage are known as chads. Example mega boss on Wakrusha, Archaeon. You should play yours if your faction has one that's even remotely decently costed, sometimes even if it's not, though that's rough. If it doesn't have flying, its effectiveness is humongously diminished, but exceptional foot stuff like 14 inch move Frostlord on Stonehorn still makes the cut. If it doesn't have a 5 up or better ward save, then you need to give it Amulet of Destiny or get used to picking it up and putting it by all your other slain models during the game. Ranged. Most of these in the game have awful war scrolls and high points points values that aren't really worth playing even with access to Unleash Hell in 3rd. GW doesn't really want Age of Sigmar to just be 40k infinite shooting the game, and I mostly agree with them. They usually do some chip damage while standing on an objective, which is alright utility. Some of them do good damage for their points, or proc mortal wounds, or both, and these are stellar. Rule of thumb, if their range is 12 inches or less, that sucks, and they need to deal mondo dam or have some strong extra perks to be worth it. A sniper is a ranged assassin or a scalpel. 10 average damage against the 2-up save, or it's probably not enough, but this is less strict than with melee ones since those tend to only get one attempt in before they die, and you can shoot every turn until someone kills them. Example, Venari or Relan Sentinels. Wizards. These are the things that cast Mystic Shield, and unbind opponent Mystic Shield, so you need to take at least one. Just try not to pay too much for yours, as most of them die when attacked, so if they have some bloated trashy war scroll with a bunch of junk on it for 200 plus points, chances are you're overpaying for rules that won't matter. As always, if they're a hero monster with 3 up base armor that can slap, then okay go nuts, but Aventus Firestrike ain't it fam. If they can't get plus 1 or better to cast somehow, they are bad. Tough luck, but play yours anyway. Unbind bonuses are primo. If your army happens to have a good spell lore, then more the better. In general, teleports and movement stuff d6 mortal wound spells, combat buffs and penalties, and movement debuffs are good. Almost everything else is like, why did they print this? Speaking of wizards, a quick guide to endless spells. Umbral Spell Portal is a strong option, but only if you feel like you're doing something gross with it, otherwise probably save your points. Works well with AoE effects. Chromatic Cogs for bonus spells can be good if it's part of an engine like in Zinch. Cogs for the charge bonus is... okay. Emerald Life Swarm is pretty expensive, but terrifying near a Chad. It can heal him to full by the time it's your opponent's next movement phase. Solsner Shackles is incredibly strong, but potentially frustrating to play against. The ones that do like D3 Mortal Wounds are almost all double what they should cost, and also suck, and are also boring. There's more, but you get the picture. Follow the same rules for spell lores, and if it costs 50 or more points, it better be real good. Priests. These took a big hit in third, to the point where many previous auto-includes are now shelved here. Curse is a very strong combat or ranged buff, but you'd like a fast or durable priest to get 9 inches away. Often a trap. Priests are skippable unless your prayer book is sick or it's part of a buff wagon, or both. Buff wagon. A big monster float that hands out buffs like it's candy at a parade. Some are not worth it like glucose, and some are excellent like dock cauldrons and STD war shrines. Often a hero, but not always. Consider what it costs and how much actual force multiplication you're getting from it applied to those units for that cost, with leeway if it's got decent defense and can fight. Being able to keep up with the movement of what you plan on buffing is important. Foot heroes. These come in two varieties, dudes that hand out synergies and dudes who are garbage. If they don't have a good synergy ability, the wizard or priest keyword, or unlock some amazing battle line, I actually don't know why they exist. Aura effects are at a premium since they stack with command abilities in third. Take note of what phase their command ability goes off in, because if it's the combat phase, it's often directly competing with all-out attack or defense, and that's a rough one. Duelist. A melee foot assassin, except without the key assassin feature of being able to zoom anywhere and fly over chaff to deliver their payload. This is a subtype of foot hero populated by like a hundred truly awful war scrolls, and then Gotrick, Sigvald, and Eltharian. I might be forgetting as many as two more, but this is a role that has been historically bad by definition. They're mostly sprinters in a steeplechase competing against birds. Chaff, also known as screens. These are generally inexpensive blobs of men whose purpose is to die so your good stuff doesn't. They usually take one medium hit to clear out, sometimes two. Any proper hammer will delete them entirely, but then be open to your counterattack. You almost always want these to be battle lines, so they can serve double duty by satisfying force organization requirements. If they aren't, then your army list can quickly become very awkward. Example, zombies, free guild guard. 
Massive regiments of bad war scroll chaff have gotten worse in 3rd edition due to coherency, and also battle tactics that tend to want your 300 point units to be able to do something other than deal 0 damage and then instantly die. A speed bump is a type of chaff that goes for the absolute cheapest possible cost and are always minimum size. Bonus points if fast, as their job is to intercept or reposition to get in the way. They might only have 4 wounds total and a 6 up save, but it still costs your opponent one of their combat phases to kill them, and there are a finite number of those per game. Example Frost Sabers, Aether Wings. Technically, you can play like a million units of these and gum up the table with a checkerboard pattern 5 inches apart to become surprisingly hard to deal with for many melee armies, but this is hugely obnoxious, you won't get a good sports score, and the TO might even overtly suggest you bring a proper army instead. Source, one of my contacts who runs a 200 person AOS tournament. Cavalry, these have no intrinsic special rules and so I just treat them as whatever other role fits be it fast anvil, hammer, chaff, etc. 12 inch move is good, 10 is standard, 8 is low. Not having flying is again a massive disadvantage. If your unit size is 2, it's probably intrinsically a bad thing because you suck at capturing even with 5 wounds, you probably don't have enough attacks and usually cost too much per model. They're bad at writing this type of war scroll and pointing it. A taker is a subcategory of cavalry that is a min-sized unit whose job is versatile utility. Line them up as chaff in deployment to protect against the alpha, then zoom to a far objective and be able to wipe out a min-sized battle line unit in one go to capture it. Enough of a hammer to reasonably kill a foot hero, but still cheap enough that it feels like it's not a waste if they have to play speed bump to some larger threat. These often tie the room together as the last 150 odd points for an otherwise well-balanced list. Or as the battle line for Gentleman Start Your Engines Alpha or Monster Mash. If you're even close to approaching 200 points, you need to start considering it some other job as well, like Anvil or Hammer, else phantom waste of points can set in. Bodyguards. These are units that have a wound transfer rule that allows a nearby hero to roll a die and on a 3 or 4 up pass off their wounds so their minions die for their master. These are viciously powerful because they stack with wards for some reason, and I honestly think GW just forgot about them when they nerfed ward stacking. Characteristics benchmarks as I see them. This isn't necessarily you must be this tall to ride, but rather a way of pinpointing a weakness so you can find rules or buffs to help it or change your strat to play around it, and or conversely to lean into your strengths. Speed, battle line 6 inches or you are slow. Cavalry, 10. Monster, 12 inch flying minimum. If you don't fly and also have like an 8 or 10 move, that is really painfully slow for a monster hero. A 4 inch terrain wall near your guy means the entire movement phase is you basically moving 1 inch, not to mention being unable to jump back and forth over your your own guys and ignore chaff screens. Foot hero movement, whatever the troops they're buffing have, and then some to stay nearby after charges. Bravery, less than 10 on a hero and you're starting to sweat your heroic healing rolls, but you probably can't help it. Armor, hero monsters, 3 up is good, 4 up is bad, 5 up is comically bad. Battle line, 4 up is normal, 5 up is chaff, 6 up is speed bump. Foot hero, kind of doesn't matter, but a 3 up is nice. Wounds, 4 wound troops are the worst number to have because you don't capture 2 but turn on a bunch of special damage rules littered throughout the game that help kill you. 10 wound heroes are the worst number to have such that 9 wounds is literally better. You exactly don't qualify for cover bonus to save, look out sir, negative 1 to get shot, nor as a sub commander for battalions, so it even hurts you in list building. Again, often can't be helped. Wards, work on wounds and mortal wounds, a 4 up ward is insane. 5 up is necessary, and 6 up is ignorable and I sleep. Wards that don't work on both are bad, but better than nothing. Wound transfers, a 2 up is critically overpowered, a 3 up is critically overpowered, and a 4 up is critically overpowered. What's better, a 2 up spell ignore or a 5 up ward? 5 up ward all day, every day, rain or shine. For hit wound rented damage values on war scrolls, these kind of don't matter. They're your starting point for applying buffs. You want to know what they will actually do on the table under normal circumstances. Figuring out their vanilla damage is just a useful thought experiment to see how bad you are if you get screwed. Do the math to figure out your bell curve of real expected outcomes, not some fractional damage number per point that has almost no relation to any in-game event. Determining efficiency is important, but you want to look at an enemy unit in-game and ballpark how likely you are to kill it so you can make better decisions during play. Keeping an eye on how consistently your buffs land and how big of a delta there is between average luck achievable damage and if things go wrong damage. In 3rd edition, my go-to is versus a 3-up save for normal damage and versus a 2-up ignoring rend 1 against heroes. I'll add a 5-up ward for chads.
Movement shenanigans. Ambush is wholly within six inches of a board edge, and it's the worst type of movement shenanigan, but it's better than nothing, as long as you can do it with a unit worth a damn. Your opponent will probably deploy to zone you out, and even if that works, you still get value since that's almost certainly not how they wanted to deploy. Deep Strike is anywhere on the board outside of nine from enemies. Like Ambush, your opponents will probably turtle up a bit, which is value. If you can't reroll charges and or have a charge bonus, then it's very likely you will fail the roll and get countercharged off the table. It's a risk even with those. Teleports come in two types, normal ones that target a unit not in combat and put them anywhere outside of 9 from enemies. These are very strong and can single-handedly take a faction up half an entire tier, in power level if consistent. Type 2 are ones you can cast on people even if they're in combat to escape and go elsewhere. These are mostly old ones, and they're significantly stronger than normal ports, for obvious reasons. Final thoughts on list building. Battalions are great. Play as many as you can. You essentially have two choices. Take Battle Regiment and put everything in it so your army is as close to one drop as possible, which means you'll get to choose who goes first, which is incredibly powerful for many reasons, but also because it means you can set yourself up for the chance at the first double turn by choosing to go second. Side note, if your opponent does this, don't move all your guys up to the middle of the table so they can be turn one charged. Mention out loud that if you get doubled after this, you'll lose, then get doubled and lose, and proceed to whine about how the double turn isn't fun. It makes you look... Option 2, forego caring about drops and fill your shopping cart with as much candy for breakfast cereal as you possibly can for free. I like Warlord, but take as many as you can reasonably qualify for. Plus, Heartlands is a strong battalion if you want your battle line Death Star to be immune to monstrous rampages. But also don't do that because I play Beast Claw and I'd like to use Roar on them, thanks. Even an optimized list has 300 odd points of room for your pet unit you think is fun. Even if you know something else is better because this is a dad game. Start thinking about how you'll deploy and some early game flow charting while building your list. It's never too early to consider strategy. Monsters that are not heroes got a little better in third because they can now monsters rampage. But they got a lot worse because hero actions are so amazing and non-anvil monsters are basically victory point pinatas for your opponent on battle tactics. Consider risk versus reward, but rule of thumb for me is to avoid them unless clear and presently powerful or a buff wagon or something. Legend status. Age of Sigmar has long been considered a dad game of tabletop war games, and this is true. If you grudgingly converted your all-foil promo altered Dan Gray Highlander pile into Commander in 2012, just to flex on kids while also not winning but looking cool doing it, then you are already fully prepared to pick up what I'm putting down. Three Dreadsorians at 2k, Nagash and Catacros with Min Battleline. Twelve Cockatrice BOC, one of all four Demon Princes plus Bellicor in STD. They know it's bad, but something happened in their brain and now this is happening. They were born under a constellation that formed the shape of a stone horn and they unhealthily love some unit rain or shine. If they play it long enough, by sheer numbers they'll eventually get so lucky as to go four and one and then the pact will be sealed. They will become legend. Their army often costs way more than the average and yet is not as good. They pay hundreds of dollars for hotel room and board, gas money, tournament entry, all to show up and deploy 42 ogre gluttons on their side of the table and then probably lose. But these people get it. AOS tournaments are basically social gatherings, and there's no cash prize pool because every Midwestern tournament is actually a charity event for some local children's hospital so it can build a bar in the waiting room. No one cares if you win AOS events. As such, you might as well play Oops All Thunder Tusks and have everyone think you're a legend, win or lose. Like with Commander, before you play an Age of Sigmar game, always have a chat with your opponent about what kind of power level you're looking for. This mostly solves any accidental that guy moments, differing personal definitions of competitive and casual notwithstanding. If it's one of their first few games ever, switch to teaching game mode. Anyway, thanks for listening to my TED Talk. I'm Haywo, I stream on Twitch, and thanks for watching.